Good morning, and welcome to, to worship here at, at DL St. Andrew's Church, whether you're with us here in person or you're watching online from your holiday house, you are welcome this morning. We're going to start off by, by singing, which expresses just the joy of coming into God's presence. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. Let's stand and sing this with joy. Yes, the last week after church and said worship was really good but nobody was clapping but it's not just about clapping actually you're smiling now aren't you we're coming into God's presence and we're singing he has made me glad so I think we could clap not only that if you're really feeling bold when I used to sing this we used to sing he has made me glad uh-huh can you manage that he has made me glad he has made me glad oh yeah so the second time he has made me glad he has made me glad. Yes. Oh yeah, really cool. That's great. And we can go more than that because we've got some instruments as well. Anyone like an instrument? I think we need to get some instruments out here. And I think we need to get all these instruments out. So let's go and find some folk that are up for it. It doesn't need to be children. Come on. Some of you folk are musical. You might even have a beat. <laughs> I'm living dangerously. There we are. We've got some xylophones as well. Come on, I know that some folk are game for it. Right, come on, let's get these out and get some folk to take them. There you are. No, some of you are game for it. There we are. There we are, Mary. Come on, we've got some more. Yeah, just take, you want to get a xylophone, and you go. Yep, that's fine. Okay, we've got most of them out. Anyone know how to use castanets? Anyone want castanets? Somebody knows how to use them, that's great. Better than me. No? Nope. There we are. There you go, Margaret. There we are. Right, let's try that again from the top, twice through. He has made me glad. Come on, he has made me glad. Uh-huh, he has made me glad. Oh yeah. Right, and remember, we're singing this whether it's musical or not. We're singing this because we're glad to be together. We're glad to be in God's presence and we have lots to celebrate. So just put on a bit of your crazy, a bit less of your Presbyterian, and let's worship together, shall we? I will enter his gate.
instruments just now. We'll use them again for the next song later. I want to start off by reading from one of the Psalms. This is where everyone goes from. I'm going to read a few verses from one of the Psalms. Here it starts this way. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. We're getting a theme here. Maybe we could try it. Let's try it this way. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. By his understanding he made the heavens. His love endures forever. He spread out the earth on the waters. His love endures forever. He made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. He remembered us in our lowest state. Love endures forever. He freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. I still think that his love endures forever. We could have just raised it a bit, couldn't we? We've got those instruments. We could really shout. That was a psalm that the people of God wrote as they came to worship with that chorus of his love endures forever. And here's the thing. If you read the psalm, I didn't read all of it, it's talking about the history of the Jewish people and all the things that God did for them. But I wonder this morning, as we come to worship, what are the things that we would be thankful for as we think about what God has done for us? Can anyone give me something that they're thankful for? Right, he gives us food on the table. His love endures forever. Let's try that again. Think about all that food that God gives you. All the beautiful things that you eat. He gives us food on the table. His love endures forever. Other things. Samuel. For creating us. Okay, for making us who we are. His love endures forever. What about other things? Right, Rebecca was at camp last week. 81 young people coming to a new commitment in Jesus. What do we say to that? His love endures forever. Anything else? However weird or wonderful that we want to give thanks for as you think about what we're here to do this morning. Nice to see his lovely world. Okay. The beauty of the lovely world around us. His love endures forever. I'm going to give you another couple of things. Anything here? Families. Okay. The family, our families and our church family here. His love endures forever. And we might add at the end of it all that he has done for us in Jesus Christ. His love endures forever. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we've sung this already in these words of your love. All the wonderful things that you've given us. All the victory that you've given us in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, sometimes we fail to worship you. Sometimes we complain and we groan about all that we haven't got or all the things that trouble us. But in your presence just now, we thank you for your love. Your love that's there in the hard times and in the good times. And as we think about Jesus and his love for us, we say together before you, his love endures forever. We're going to pray just now, saying the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. His love endures forever. We're going to sing again just now, and we're going to sing 
praise him on the trumpet, the psaltery and harp. We don't have any trumpets or psalteries or harps, although we've got some xylophones if anyone wants to play along with those. But let's hear the instruments and let's praise God, let's clap and let's just praise him in these words, which again come from the book of Psalm, Psalm 150. You want to play it? read from God's Word. I just realized I've left some of you with the instruments. So if you agree with what I'm saying, you can, you can shake them. And if you don't, well, you can throw them. Um, but uh, let's, let's, let's read. No, that wasn't, yeah. That, let's read God's word together now. We're going to read, first of all, a familiar um, passage from John chapter 10, verses uh, 11 to 18. Let's read the word of God from the gospel of John. Oh. There we have it. Nope, that's the end of it. Well, I just read it and you can catch up with me. I'll, I'll, I'll just read and, and, and the screen will catch up with me. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life 
only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And then we're going to read from the letter of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'm reading the first 11 verses. To the elders among you, writes Peter, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. And all of you, Clothe yourself with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you had suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to these words that come from our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, and from the apostles. And as we read them today, we pray, Lord, that they would be of comfort to us and challenge to us, and that you would lead us in the right paths. Amen. In these last weeks, uh, leadership's been on the news quite a lot. I, I, we were in holiday when we heard that the Prime Minister had resigned, or had he resigned? He's not gone yet, has he? Um, but the Prime Minister had resigned, and we were also hearing that the, the roads were melting because it was 40 degrees, and I was just waiting to come back and find that the, the, the sun had gone out and the end of the world had come. But yeah, these days, it's all about leadership, isn't it? leadership contests and different types of leaders and all the rest of it. And I think one of the things that's striking about the current debate about leadership at the moment or the prime minister is it's not just about policy. It's about character. Do we want to have leaders who are honest in a world of spin? Do we want to have leaders that when they tell us to do something, are actually doing it themselves? Is there an integrity about the life that they have? Or are they using their office to have a party, to look after the cronies, and just do what they want? Big questions about what we want for leaders. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult in this age because we have become very, very cynical about people who lead, haven't we? Whether it's in business, whether it's in uh, the church, or whether it's in education, or whether it's in politics. It doesn't matter what your politics are, we become very, very cynical, down to the level you actually think, who would want these jobs? What abuse are they going to get? What are people going to say about them? What's it going to be said on, on social media or in the newspapers about what they do? How are they going to pry into their private lives? Now, some of that's right, because Unfortunately, we've had to become a lot more wary because sometimes leadership is abused, even in the church. So we turn to this last passage from Peter's letter, and it's about leadership. 
Now, in the early church, there was perhaps no more prominent a leader than Peter. Peter was the spokesman for the disciples in the Gospels. He was the one that Jesus singled out. He called him the rock. He, he put him in charge, as it were. And when we read the book of Acts, we find that in the early days in Jerusalem, Peter seemed to be in charge. He was the prominent original leader in the church of Jerusalem. And if we read beyond the book of Acts into the early church tradition, we find that the story is that Peter went to Rome, uh, and in Rome he was, if not the founder of the church, certainly its first leader, the, the first bishop, as it were, of Rome. And the authority of Peter in the early church appears to have been undisputed. A really important figure. And yet, I don't know about you, but as I read that chapter, and sometimes when we read a chapter of the Bible, it's, it's not just about digging down into all the words that are used. It's getting a, a sense of the tone. And as you read those 11 verses from 1 Peter 5, did you get the sense of a gentle person? A gentle person with a pastor's heart, really looking out for the folk that are there under him. He starts it off in a very simple way. He says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. He didn't start off by saying, I am the bishop of Rome, the rock of the church, the first disciple, the one that Jesus called first, and therefore I am telling you how you should do it. He just simply said, elders, leaders, I'm coming along beside you because I know what it is to lead God's people. So let me encourage you. It's a real humility of leadership. Now that word elder, the Greek word is presbyteros, from which we get our word presbyter, from which we get the expression presbyterian. I'll come back on to that maybe later. But it's an originally a Jewish term, and it simply meant those in the community might be in the synagogue or it just might be in the village, that were sort of instinctively seen as those who were the leaders. Not necessarily people who had been put in any special office, but those who were respected as the leaders. And as the disciples went out and they planted new churches and they drew communities, what they would do as they left and moved on to start the next city is they would appoint among the people that had been gathered there and become Christians, elders. They'd appoint one or two folk who seemed to have the right gifts to lead the church. Now, it wasn't that they had to sign on as charitable trustees because they had to look after a building and do the maintenance work and, and all the stuff that goes with it today. They were simply people who were asked to lead the new believers, to teach the new believers, to direct them and encourage them. And what Peter is saying to these elders is, you are doing just the same thing that Jesus called me to do. We're fellow elders together. Now, it's interesting that our Presbyterian structure literally means that we are governed, we are led, not by people above us, by bishops, but by the local leaders in a place, people who live and work among us. But what we're talking about today isn't just for those that are elders here. It's actually for anybody that is in any position of Christian influence or leadership. So it would apply um, equally to those of you who are leading in the Sunday school, in a boys' brigade, those of you who are involved in leading in the guild or any other organization, or those that just have influence and you're aware you have influence on other younger Christians, that God has put you in that role. It might apply to parents as well. And here is what Peter begins by saying to these fellow elders. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. It's interesting that um, the Bible often refers to us as God's people as being God's flock. We're sheep. Or somebody said, we are the sheep of God. You, do you know you were sheep? What's your response to being told you're sheep? 
Yeah, bah. And of course, you're sheep, aren't you? Because you're cuddly, cute, soft, and photogenic. That's what it means, doesn't it? Uh, no. No, it doesn't. Actually, sheep are stupid. They're wayward. They're helpless. They follow the crowd. That is the idea of sheep. Is actually, when, we, when we're called the sheep in the Bible, it, it means that we're actually quite vulnerable. I, I, I was reading something the other day about sheep, and it, it, it pointed out this. If, 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 you, if you have any other type of animal, it doesn't behave like a sheep. A sheep, if you open the, the, the pen of a, 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 a gate, a gate of a, a field, any other animal will do one of two things. Either it will bolt and make its bid for freedom, or it will be intelligent enough to know that actually it's well fed where it is, and so it, so it will stay put because it knows that its master feeds it. A sheep won't do either of those things. It will just wander. In fact, what happens often when you open a sheep gate um, is that the sheep just wanders up and down and gets stressed because it doesn't know what to do. That's a sheep for you. Little Bo Peep. Sheep. Doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them. Actually, that's garbage. Sheep will not know how to get home. It won't have a clue. It will just get stressed. But the thing about sheep in this image that the Bible uses of sheep is both that the sheep are very vulnerable, but there's another part of the image. And there's a reason why God doesn't call us the herd, but the flock. Because sheep also have a very particular relationship with their shepherd. The shepherd sleeps among the sheep. The shepherd tends caringly for the sheep, and the sheep get to know the shepherd. I was reading something else that, that, that was talking about a, a, a shepherd, and he'd taken the sheep to market, and then he was passing by the, 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 play, the field that they'd been put in, um, in the train, and the sheep came to him because the sheep recognized who he was. You are the sheep of God. You are God's flock. And this is a, a huge image in Scripture where God talks about himself as being the shepherd of the people. Famously in Psalm 23, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that whole image of God leading the sheep, looking after the sheep, tending the sheep, protecting the sheep. And of course, that image of the gentleness of God was written by a shepherd, wasn't it? It was written by King David, who actually knew what it was to have that relationship with the sheep. And here's the thing, that as, as David protected the sheep, as David later on became a king, that image of, of God being the shepherd became an, another image of God appointing shepherds, under shepherds, to look after his sheep. And that becomes another very strong image in the Bible of the king, of the leader of God's people as being the shepherd of my people Israel. The shepherd of my people Israel. And that will go on being used in Scripture of those that lead the people of God that lead the people of God, that look after and care for God's valuable people. And it, it uses a criticism as well. In, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, there is a message given, and it starts like this. Therefore, shepherds, listen to the Lord's message. Shepherds doesn't mean those that look after sheep. It means the leaders of God's people. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, my sheep have become prey and food for wild beasts because there was no shepherds and the shepherds did not search for the flock but fed themselves and did not feed my sheep. And you will find that criticism again in the Bible. I gave you my sheep to look after. I gave you the things I love and I care for and I look after and you have abused them and you have neglected them and you have let them wander off. What type of shepherds are you? Corrupt and in it for yourselves. And then in the midst of all of that, of God's people going astray, Jesus comes. What does he say? I am the good shepherd. Because I care for my sheep. Because they know my name. 
because I give myself for them. All like sheep have gone astray, turned each one to his own way. But I have taken them on myself and I lay down my life for them. And if you take nothing else from this passage today, take that idea of Jesus who loves you so much, who loves you so much that he has laid down his life for you. And he comes to you in gentleness as he calls you back. Peter talks about the people of God. In chapter 1, he said, you like sheep have gone astray, but you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You know, Jesus' love for the sheep is shown right through the Gospels. That lovely image, isn't there, of, of Jesus saying the shepherd has a hundred sheep, but he goes after that one. Maybe you're that one today. Maybe you're here today because the Lord is trying to reach out to you and tell you of his love and bring you back into that place where you know him and have a relationship with him. So this passage is about the care the gentleness of our, our, our shepherd. And I, I love that verse, verse 7. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. It's a great memory verse if you do memory verses. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Like that stressed sheep running up and down, doesn't know where he's going. Cast all your anxieties on him for he cares for you. Your shepherd is here. But what this passage is saying as Peter addresses the elders, he says to them, you've to be shepherds. You've to be shepherds of God's sheep. And again, that's a strange thing to say until you think what Jesus' last words before the ascension were to Peter, as he took Peter in all his failures, and he said to him, feed my sheep, look after my lambs. And here's Peter saying to the leaders of the church, that commission applies to you to look after the sheep, to care for them. This is what we share together in any form of Christian leadership. And it is an awesome responsibility because this is God's flock. God has put into your hands the most precious thing that he possibly could. You ever had that experience of somebody handing you a baby and you don't know which way up to hold it? I, I, and you're suddenly grabbing on because you suddenly realize that what you have in your arms is incredibly vulnerable and incredibly valuable. And it's like that. That's what Peter's saying. God has put into your hands something that is very valuable to him. He died. His son died for these sheep. And now you are being given them. And this is an awesome responsibility, the most precious thing. That's what Jesus communicated to Peter on the shore of Galilee that day when he told him to feed my sheep, look after my lambs. He was saying to Peter, who had failed him in so many ways, he was saying to him, I trust you, I love you so much, I am going to give to you, put into your hands, my most precious thing. If you are a leader in any sense in God's church, and most folk here, many folk here, are in some way, you have been given an awesome responsibility. You know, sometimes, and I'll say this to the elders among you and to those that are on the board and those that are involved in, in committees, you think you've got an awesome responsibility because you've been charged with the legacy of D.L. St. Andrews. You're responsible for maintaining this building. You've got to have the safety reports done and the risk assessments done. And you've got to make sure the finances are right. And so we scrutinize the finances to make sure that it's all done correctly and all the right accounts and we're spending money in responsible ways. Well, yeah, those things are important, but they really, really, really are not important compared to what God has given you. The gift that he gives you are those people whom he died for in his son. And in the long 
strength of it. God came and he loved those people so much that he's given you. He didn't love this building. He didn't love the structure of the Church of Scotland. He didn't love all those other things that we take and, 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 and do matter in, in some ways. But he gave you people and, and your job is to stop them wandering. It's to keep them close where they're safe spiritually, where they can grow and be fed, to care for them. What's our model of leadership as Christians? To return back to the conservative leadership contest, what's the role model that Mr. Sunak and uh, Miss, Mrs. Trust, Miss Trust uh, are, 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 have got? They're all competing, aren't they, to see who's the real Thatcherite. The model is, is Mrs. Thatcher for the conservative party. What is the model that Peter gives here? I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness to Christ's sufferings. I saw how Jesus loved, how Jesus suffered, how Jesus gave himself for me on the cross. I saw how Jesus didn't try to grab power and authority and lord it over us, but he served us. He, you know that guy washed our feet? That's the model. To be like Jesus. And Peter will say in this, it, it mustn't be about dishonest gain. Too many folk are in things for money. That's the whole point he makes about the hired shepherds. The hired shepherds might do a reasonable job most of the time, but they don't love the sheep. They love the cash that they get for the job. And therefore, if it becomes a choice between the job and, 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 and their safety, they'll choose their safety and they'll off when the wolf comes. But the folk that love the sheep will always stay. Will always stay. They're not in it for themselves. I, I, there's a, an American evangelist. It's gone into the newspapers a, a while ago. He's got a great name, Creflo Dollar. Just says it all, doesn't it? Creflo Dollar wrote out to his followers and asked them for money because he had a project he wanted to fund. Now, we do that as a church. We say we, we need money to, to keep things going. Are you able to give? He wanted a jet. He needed to have had a new jet. He already had one, I think. And it was going to cost $64 million. And so he asked his people, would they give him the money so he could get the jet because that would enable him to do God's work. Would Jesus have done that? No. But you see, all the time in churches where we have a little bit of power or in business where we have a little bit of power or in a family where we have a little bit of power, there is always that temptation, isn't there, just to make sure that I'm getting the respect that I'm due, that I'm getting the position that I'm due. It happens in churches as well, by the way. We, we, we use the responsibilities we've got to get our own way. We all do. I do it too. But the Jesus example of really saying, I'm here to serve and give myself for the sheep, not lording it over the others, but serving with a humility. It's interesting that what he says here in, in verse 5, in the same way you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders. That's a great verse, isn't it? The young folks should do what I tell them. Uh, and I think many of you who are maybe a little older think that's a great verse, isn't it? You should submit to your elders. You should do what you're told. But you see, it's interesting when Scripture does this and it, it singles out one group and it says you need humility. Um, it, it generalizes. The reason this, this passage is saying this to, to, to young folk is it's actually saying to all of us, if there are people who are over you in the Lord, maybe not structurally, but they just may be people who you know are wise and, and you know are mature, respect that. Learn from that. Be humble enough to be teachable. Be humble enough to accept a rebuke. Be humble enough that when someone comes and says, you're not doing that right, rather than getting defensive, of saying, what can I learn from this? Be humble enough to say, I need help. Be humble enough to say, I don't understand. Can someone help me? 
Be humble enough to share your problems with each other so that you can get the assistance you need. One of the biggest problems in churches is not that there's a lack of people willing to help people. It's there's a lack of people willing to say, I need help. And therefore, people wander off in their faith because they've not had the humility to say, I'm struggling. Will someone pray with me? I've got questions. Can you help me? But that humility is something more than that because, you see, it's very easy in, it, it, sometimes to take one verse and say, this group of people should be doing what they're told. There's, there's another part of, of, of the letters where it says, um, wives, submit to your husbands. Lots of people got a problem with that. Right? Feminism gets offended. But the problem is it's taken out of context because that verse, wife, submit to your husband, starts off with a verse that says, submit to one another, all of you. And it ends up with the next verse which says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Which means submitting to her needs, washing her feet, going to the cross for her. And so suddenly, one bit that's saying wives should be submissive is actually in the context of saying husbands should submit as Jesus served, and all of us should submit to one another. That puts a whole different spin on it, doesn't it? It's the same here. Young men, submit to your elders because that's humility that lets you grow. But in the context of this passage, Peter is also saying all of you need humility. And that's, by the way, going to be more difficult if you're any type of leadership role. Because that's the place where it's easy to get puffed up. And if we are to grow together, if we are to make sure that our, we come together as God's sheep, that we're looked after, and that we look after one another, then we need humility. By the way, I will say again in this passage, elders is not necessarily an age thing. Let's remember that Jesus was in his 30s, died. When Peter was told to care for those sheep, Peter was probably in his early 20s, and John was a teenager, and they were put in charge, and people were told to submit to them because God had given them a charisma, a calling to be leaders. So it's not necessarily an age thing at all. The point is that we become teachable and humble and submit and all of our leadership modeled on Christ. And what's it all about? It's about enabling us to grow. It's about enabling us to stay close. It's about preventing us wandering off. Very practically today, um, folk were saying to me as they came in that there are people who they don't see in church. Um, uh, and disappointed that they hadn't seen them. Can I, can I just simply say all of us can take a responsibility there. Is there someone that you, you've missed? You haven't seen them around? Are you able to give them a call? Do you know them? Speak to them? Encourage them? Care for them? That, that responsibility does rest with those of us that are elders, but it, it, it is a responsibility that we also share together as we grow together. If you are today needing help, ask. Find someone whose maturity, whose leadership you can respect and you can come to. But more than all of that, know that God loves you and cares for you. His son gave his life for you and you matter to him. Cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Amen. Let's sing together, the Lord's my shepherd.
No, we're on. We're going to pray together. One of the things that we want to pray for this morning is the Holiday Club, which starts um, on Monday. Um, we're running that for primary age children, and we're hoping lots of them will be there. It's called Wonder Zone, and we're going to be looking at the wonders of God's wonderful world. And during that, it's a sort of science lesson of looking at the whole of creation. We're going to be doing some experiments and blowing things up. So if they come and find there's a big hole in the side of the building, because we've, you know, we won't promise. Debbie, we won't, will we? Don't know. Not completely guaranteed. But we're going to have a lot of fun, a lot of songs, uh, and a lot of sharing together. And I hope that you will pray for us this week. How many folk here are involved in any way in the Holiday Club? There's a number here. Yep. So please do remember these folk this week, and we'll pray for them um, just now in all that they're doing. Pray also for our elders. Um, Kirk Session will be meeting and we'll have a lot to do in the, the months ahead because we'll have to think about how we go forward as a church. We're also dealing with a presbytery plan, um, which we'll be finding out more about in September. We don't know any more than we've told you already, but do pray for that because part of our, our, our church is being involved with other churches and pray as we try to shape the Church of Scotland and its mission in the days that come. So we would also be wanting to pray just now for those that are preparing to lead in our organizations. I know that some of you are already beginning to think back about what happens when the BB starts or the Giddles Brigade starts or the Brownies start or the Guild uh, or the men's group. I've already had my request to speak. Um, so I know that the secretaries are working away on programs. So pray for all those that are involved in the leadership. But pray, I think, particularly um, for those in any form of leadership that it wouldn't be the structures or the program, but it would be the people that are at the heart of that. Sometimes the planning meeting is less important than the phone call or the openness just to be alongside people. Let's pray. Father, we come and we thank you for your care for us. We thank you that you are like our shepherd that you sent your son Jesus Christ to be the good shepherd, that he served us with humility, that he gave his life for us, that he chased after us when we turned away from him, that he calls out to us even now. And if there are some of us here right now who know that we've strayed off, that we've wandered away, maybe we've been here but our hearts haven't been in it, Lord, we thank you that right now you simply invite us to come. Lord, we don't know the hearts of one another, but we know our own hearts that we wander off and therefore we know that others do too. We pray that you would help us to be encouragers, to be those that bring back, to be those that ask and listen. We pray, Lord, for our elders. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them love, that you would give them care, that they might model themselves on Jesus in order that they might help us model ourselves on Jesus. We pray for those that lead in our organizations and in our church life in so many ways, whether that is because they hold some office or appointment or whether that is just because you've given them gifts to encourage and direct. Oh Lord, give them a heart for people and grant to us all the humility to be teachable, to be people that can be led by your leaders. Lord, we pray for the safeguarding in our church, that we would always be alert to the possibility of the abuse of power, that we would have hearts to protect those that are most vulnerable. We pray for those that have been scarred. Lord, maybe some of us here because we have had leaders who have abused our trust or neglected us. Assure us, Lord, that you love us, that you heal us, and put into our lives Christian friends who have care for us. We pray today 
for our holiday club, Lord, that opportunity to reach out to children. We don't know how many will come, but we pray that you would send the people that you want us to share with and love and care for. We pray for the team, that you would bind them together in all that they do, that they would not lose sight of your calling on their lives to share the news of Christ Jesus. Bless us today. Whatever anxiety we come with, we cast it onto Jesus, for He cares for us. Amen. Let's close by singing before the throne of God above. Now may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you had suffered a little while, may he restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever.